about better days and hopefully better days to come. And now I'll recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll start with uh, recognitions and announcements, um, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tomorrow, August 27th, marks the second and final day of our new teacher orientation that is scheduled uh, this year for our new teachers and staff to the Woonsocket Education Department. Uh, the first meeting was held on August 13th. Um, um, Mickey Dargan, our Human Resources and Labor Relations Director, um, as well as uh, Dr. Holt, coordinated the orientation um, along with Heather Neal and, and Jess Donato. Um, the, the group was split in, in about two even um, sections, approximately 20 and 20. Uh, the agenda in, included and will include tomorrow uh, a welcome by myself. Um, central administrators have been invited um, to introduce themselves to our new employees. Uh, the new employee packets and the distribution of technology, which includes primarily the uh, Chromebook that our staff are issued when they um, are hired in the WED. Um, there's also a, a Woonsocket Education Department escape room challenge, which is coordinated by um, uh, Mrs. Neal and Mrs. Donato, our blended learning coaches. Um, and then in the afternoon, uh, Dr. Holt goes over the mentor and the induction program with our new hires. Uh, and then finally, uh, the introduction to Woonsocket apps, our applications that our, our teachers and staff use uh, throughout the district with their, with their students. And that's going to be with um, Mrs. Neal and Mrs. Donato as well. So the uh, August 13th orientation went very well. Uh, we received a lot of positive feedback from our are, are soon to be uh, new teachers and staff. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow's orientation. The orientation, uh, both orientations uh, run from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. Any comments, questions uh, regarding recognitions and announcements? If not, I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the recognitions and announcements. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. All in favor? Uh, Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus? Yes. Next, I'll make a motion to approve the August 13, 2020 open session minutes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Are there any corrections, deletions, adjustments to the minutes? Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Abstain. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Next, we'll go into the uh, motion, uh, the, the consent agenda, and I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Uh, is there any item uh, in the consent agenda that uh, any member wanna, wants to pull out of order and discuss separately. I know I have one item. Uh, in the purchases section uh, for tonight's approval, there is an item that is identified as Catapult Learning LLC, special education. The cost is $1,711,693.04. And it's listed as day program for 38 students. and. I'm not sure what in the world they're gonna be able to do for us uh, since I don't think their plan is complete. Um, and it seems to me that we should uh, take that out of the purchases for this evening under an, an amendment to the uh, consent agenda. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Perrier. Uh, yes. Uh, that uh, I was looking to make that uh, motion as well. Uh, we are currently still awaiting uh, the final plans from the High Road School. Uh, we were hopeful to have them before the school committee meeting, but because we haven't received their final plans for the school year, we'd like to remove this and put it on for the next school committee agenda. Okay. Any any other thoughts about this item? 
I'll second that motion. Um, any other items within the consent agenda you'd like to pull out? On the amendment, uh, I'll make a motion to amend the consent agenda by pulling out that item of 1,711,000. Is there a second? Second. second. For the amendment. Dr. McGee, roll call for the amendment. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Now, on the, uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Papwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. We don't have any co uh, communications. And so, Dr. McGee, I'll turn it over to you for your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two items this evening under my superintendent's report. The first is I'd like to talk a little bit about our administrative retreat, which we concluded today. Um, as you and the committee are aware, each summer we coordinate an administrative retreat, which includes all of the directors, myself, all of the principals, and all of our assistant principals. Um, typically, we we hold our retreat in person, face to face, um, at, a, at a at a location uh, that's usually designated each year. Um, during the course of the retreat, each year we we typically will talk about our goals for the upcoming year, um, as well as any other types of professional development that would be necessary for our um, administrators in the, in the areas typically of instructional leadership. So this year was a little different. Um, however, we were fortunate enough to uh, work with uh, the Teaching and Learning Alliance, Dr. Scott Morstell and Mr. Ed Lee, who are um, actually the, the, the two uh, gentlemen that facilitated our strategic plan uh, this, this year for the next three years. Um, and we so we worked with them over the course of, of two days. They were two half day retreat sessions um, where we we looked at um, a, a plan for beginning next year and extending beyond next year for two more years um, in the area of improving teaching, learning, and leading in the Woonsocket Education Department. Um, yesterday and today, we went over uh, the definition of our expectations for our teachers and, and staff uh, for teaching and learning. Uh, those expectations come directly from our educator evaluation um, standards, which we use here in, in the district. We, we call it the I-3. We're an innovative uh, innovation district. Um, so we utilize the, the, the teaching standards from, uh, from that instrument. We also I, I are in the process of identifying key focus areas for the 2021 school year. Um, and that will be culminating this year. Um, in the fall, we're gonna do some virtual learning walks. Um, and then in the spring, hopefully when we're back, um, you know, full, full in person, um, then we will be conducting some, some in-person learning walks. A learning walk basically is um, an opportunity for uh, administrators, um, staff members to go into, into classrooms and to just observe teaching and learning, you know, look to to see what what the classroom um, setup looks like, uh, looking to see, you know, what different kinds of conversations teachers are having with students, students are having with students. It's all for the promotion and the uh, the, the promotion of, of of teaching and learning, with the ultimate goal of um, improving student achievement. Everything that we do, um, and I'll talk about this a little later when I refer to our strategic plan. The, the outcome of everything that we look to do here in the, in the WED is to improve student achievement. So I'm really excited about the work we started with, uh, with Scott today, and we're gonna continue working with Scott. Um, uh, our next meeting with him is in October. And as I said, this work will follow through the course of this year and will extend beyond the next two years. I don't know if anyone has any questions relating to the first topic. Good. So the second item I have is um, uh, some an update on our 2021 school reopening plan. So I want to start with first uh, there there was an article in the Providence Journal today, which um, described the uh, eight 
AFT districts in the state, uh, when socket is included, um, what what we've done, and this is a conversation that we've we've had uh, for for a few weeks now, at least for probably a month. Um, as as the committee is aware, uh, we, being myself and and our uh, AFT union president Robert Stewart, have been working and meeting with the other AFT superintendents and union presidents in the state um, in res with respect to creating our reopening plans. As everyone knows, we, we submitted our reopening plans to ride back in the middle of, uh, of July. Um, but this letter that was, that was penned from all of the, the, those, those eight districts, um, and it's, it was um, sent to the governor, um, basically states that um, there's a there's a strong possibility that that we may open the school year remotely uh, due to a variety of reasons. As you know, the governor uh, sent out uh, a, a series of five criteria or benchmarks that districts across the state are going to use when they uh, make the decision of how they're going to reopen. Um, one of those areas is. Um, deals with with ventilation and airflow in buildings classrooms and and in offices and and that was one of the that's one of the areas that uh the the superintendents and the union presidents from the aft districts uh are are very concerned about with respect to to reopening district-wide um, so that was sent out today i know that there was a little confusion i think initially in that um the uh the message was that that the, the eight districts would definitely open remotely um, and it's may open remotely um, because as the committee knows, um, we still have um, some more work to do with respect to making sure that um, each of those five benchmarks are met so that we can reopen with all of our students. Um, secondly, the, uh, the Department of Education sent to uh, superintendents a couple of days ago of facilities and physical plant guidance for reopening. Um, this all kind of stems from a meeting that was held about a week and a half ago uh, with a Dr. Uh, Bromage from UMass Dartmouth. Uh, Dr. Bromage had a meeting with facilities directors um, and, and some superintendents across the state. And Dr. Bromage um, explained the um, the, the, the process by which schools will, will measure, you know, their, their safe ventilation and air quality um, as we prepare to reopen. Uh, so, so I think as a result of that, the Department of Ed sent out this, this guidance, which talks about a variety of, of things. And sp uh, specifically, it, it talks about ventilation and, and HVAC systems and increasing outdoor air ventilation um, within rooms, hallways, um, and buildings. And it talks about things such as um, having a minimum of four to six air changes per hour. Uh, again, those are, th those are some, some topics that we discussed last, uh, last time. The, the, um, the Department of Health is scheduling uh, visits to each district uh, beginning next week. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to send out Folks, we've already scheduled our visit for next Tuesday, and that is to check airflow and ventilation in each building, in each classroom in the building. Uh, the governor made the announcement that every single school in the state would go through this process. Uh, so they they called uh, my office and my administrative assistant, uh, Ms. Blaze, scheduled uh, that, that visit for next Tuesday. So we're going to go through each of our buildings each room, um, and they're going to provide feedback to us with respect to air ventilation and air quality, and what you know, what, what are the different types of um, of actions we're going to need to take to mitigate um, the um, the air quality. So that's scheduled. We also, I believe, Mr. Natariani um, has scheduled um, a, a a company to come in as well, in addition to to that to go through our buildings with us. Um, and, and again, to, to look at ventilation, to look at airflow and, and provide us with recommendations 
um, as well. So that that will happen uh, over the over the course of, of the next week or so. Um, we also just an update on our uh, PPEs and our cleaning supplies. We have placed orders. We've also uh, received uh, orders. Uh, the state of Rhode Island uh, provided um, a certain amount of PPEs and cleaning supplies for districts. Uh, our our facilities department uh, went to to pick those up recently. I believe it was this week. Um, and there, all, all of those PPEs and cleaning supplies are housed currently at our central receiving area, which is at Woonsocket High School. So in, in terms of cleaning supplies and PPEs, we're, we're still in the process of, of, um, of receiving them. The orders have, have been placed. They're going to continue to be placed. So with respect to PPEs and cleaning supplies, I think we're in a good position right now. Um, we don't have everything, but we believe that, you know, however we reopen on, on September 14th, whether, whether it's, you know, a, a partial in-person, a hybrid, um, if, if anyone's back, uh, we will have the necessary uh, PPE equipment as well as cleaning supplies uh, stocked in each of our schools for that. Um, let me talk a little bit about instruction uh, because I know we, we've been, as, as we should have been, we've been talking a lot about health and safety um, and the physical plant of our, you know, conditions uh, throughout the district. But I just wanted to let uh, the committee and the community know that uh, through the leadership and, and facilitation of, of Dr. Holt, uh, we have, have had teams of teachers and staff across the district from grades K through 12 who have been working on things called priority standards. Um, these priority standards are, are, um, are basically standards by grade level, and they're the, the most important the most important standards um, that, that students uh, should be exposed to um, each year. And we're taking those priority standards and we're aligning those with the core curriculum. So that work has, has begun. Um, at the elementary level, I believe they're practically finished. Uh, the secondary level, the, the, the high school especially, because we have so many different elective courses, it's gonna take them a little bit longer, but that work will be completed. Um, by September 14th. So I, I want to I want to thank Dr. Holt and, and her her team and, uh, and 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 the teachers and staff across the district who have been who have been working on that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, the um, the uh, letters. Uh, the letter that I, I recently sent out a letter to parents e explaining, you know, the situation uh, that we're in with respect to, you know. We're basically in in a, in a holding pattern as we're waiting on the governor's announcement on Monday. Um, I, I will say this, and and this is consistent with what I've been saying really from the from the beginning. We've put plans together, and, and we you know, we we've checked off the boxes, so to speak. We were required to submit uh, four plans. Uh, one of those four. Uh, in, includes a full virtual return. So we've done that. We received feedback. From Ride, uh, we resubmitted um, some portions of, of those of those plans, um, and, and the the Department of Ed acknowledged that they've received it. Um, so we we've we've done everything that that the Department of Ed has asked us to do so far with respect to creating our reopening plans. And as I said, we're waiting um, for Governor Raimondo to make. Don't know what decision she's going to make on Monday, but. I, I can I will I will say this. Um, I'm not going to send any teachers or staff into rooms that are deemed unsafe with respect to ventilation and airflow. Now, that could mean a variety of things come September 14th, because between now and September 14th, you know, as I stated, uh, we're going to be receiving some feedback about our, our buildings specifically. Uh, ventilation and airflow, and um, so we're going to take that information. We're going. We we already have plans in place to go around and replace uh, air filters. That's going to take time. Many of those air fil th those air filters are not going to arrive by September 14th. We're also going to um, have a um, contracted company come out, and they're going to be cleaning. The, the duct work um, as, as part of our ventilation systems and our HVAC systems, um, the buildings that have HVAC systems, and then the duct work 
of, of the other buildings that just have uh, ventilation um, equipment. They're not going to complete this by September 14th. Um, they're backlogged, as you can imagine. Um, so I, again, when we go around and we look at the classrooms and we get feedback from the uh, Department of Health, if there are classrooms that, that are not safe in terms of air quality for our students and staff to return to, I'm not sending them back to those rooms. Um, now, what, what could that look like? So it could we, so we, when we look across the district, there may be some schools where there are some rooms that have um, a safe and healthy airflow ventilation system on September 14th. If that's the case, then we can utilize those rooms. Um, but I'm not utilizing rooms that, that, are, that are not deemed um, safe in terms of ventilation and, and airflow. I know I've said it about four times, but, but I, I really want to, um, I, I re really want people to understand that. My job is to make sure that when our kids and our, and our staff return, that they're, they're coming back to, to, to healthy rooms and, health, and safe rooms and safe buildings. Um, I'm the first to, to say, I wanna get our, our kids and our staff back as, as quickly as possible. Um, but I want to do it as safely as possible. So there are a lot of things that we're going to be taking into consideration. The governor said um, of those five metrics or those five benchmarks, if we can't meet, meet each of those five, then we don't return to those, to those buildings or those classrooms. So uh, again, I, I wish I could definitively say right now we're, we're starting the year completely virtual, or I wish I could say that we're, we're starting the year um, in a hybrid model. Right now, I would be lying if I said either, but I can tell you that it could possibly look like um, some groups come back to rooms that are safe and some groups would not come back initially because other um, rooms or, or areas are not healthy and safe for them to come back. And, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if you are, uh, or other members of the committee have any questions? Um, sure. Um, the ventilation issue is, is a big one. The filters and the will not be installed, completely installed by the 14th. Neither will the duct work be, uh, cleaning will be done. So the only way we could open based on our facilities is going, to deter, is going to be determined by the site visit next week and then by, by, the, by the Department of Health and by our, the engineer uh, engineering firm that we've contracted. So they will identify what classrooms, which, which buildings, which classrooms are safe. Um, and that's going to be very interesting because if, if the filters aren't there, it's, I, I would think that only a small number of classrooms will be okay, but we'll find out. Um, you didn't mention testing. Um, one of the benchmarks or the criteria the governor has is she's got to be able to test. We we have to be able to test children with, or teachers or staff with symptoms, uh, and then turn it and turn that around within 48 hours. And the last I heard, she was ready to do that. Uh, so we don't even know if that's going to be if that's going to be available come the 14th. And the last big item is transportation, is what is going to be available and how is all of that going to work? And one more is staffing. If we don't have enough teachers to uh, staff our schools, we know that we're not going to be able to find enough uh, substitutes uh, to cover a large number of, of teachers that just uh, choose not to go in because of the dangers associated with COVID. Um, just using age as an example. So uh, a lot of it is hanging on, on not just the ventilation, but some of these other areas that were, I just mentioned. Um, but we will determine that. And I would think we have to make a decision. Uh, I would say we've got what? School committee on the 9th? It seems to me by the 9th, we've got to know pretty much where we are because we've got to let the parents know and the community know what we're doing. So we have a very short window to decide this because at that point um, it's it's getting ready, getting ready for either virtual school or it's going to be uh, a limited, um, you know, in-person schooling. That's that's going to be done. So um, 
in my opinion, we've got a long way to go in a very short time to come up with these decisions. But I'm hoping next week when we go visit the schools that we can identify which rooms and how many children can we fit in a good rooms, quote, good rooms, safe rooms. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what number we come up with um, because at the end of the day, it may not make any sense to open. But like you say, the word is may. Um, but it's not, it's, it certainly doesn't look like we've got a bright horizon to open this up fully in person or even in a hybrid as we start. Anyone else have any thoughts, comments with regards to the superintendent's report? Chairman Bourget. This is Capo, please. Thank you. Um, you covered actually most of my questions with, with the filters and transportation, so thank you. Um, did, did we receive back um, guidance from legal uh, out, coming out of our, our last meeting that we as the school committee are the deciding body um, and approvers when it comes to what we uh, what what happens for go back. We do not have definitive, but my discussion with our attorney, um, they've done quite a bit of research and I'm expecting a definitive letter to come to my attention and then the school committee's attention as to what uh, our authority is. And it appears that uh, the governor may not have the authority to open the schools. She had the authority to close them because it was she declared a crisis in the state. So obviously we're closed. Um, and she did that back in March. But in terms of opening the schools, uh, it appears that uh, she may not have, and I use the word may, until I have that letter in my hand. But it looks like that's the way to go. And the, um, and the responsibility and authority will lie with the school committee. So whatever plan that comes up, it's you know, it's going to be working with the superintendent to decide what we're going to do. Thank you so much. That's, yeah. that's where we're going. And I would, I'm expecting that sometime this week, maybe early next week. But I'm hoping by uh, the school committee meeting on the 9th, we know exactly what's going on. And probably we'll have a closed session to have uh, attorney report to talk to us about this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. I share Burke. Thank you. Um, these, these five benchmarks that, that Dr. McGee has been talking about at the last at least two school committee meetings, um, they, they really were just thrown at the districts. Was it mid-July or, or beginning of, was it mid-July that all of a sudden these five benchmarks appeared? Yeah, right. So, so here yeah. we are and here we've been the last several weeks you know, trying to catch up with, with ventilation and cleaning ducts and getting filters. Um, and obviously we, we weren't given much, you know, a heads up. <laughs> so, I mean, we've been trying to do, and I, and I applaud uh, Al and, and Dr. McGee for, uh, you know, for trying to, to, to address all these things. But, but they came at us really just several weeks ago at most. Is that correct? I mean, these were, these were kind of new thrown out of it. It has. Um, it, it's yes. Th those were not things that we were aware of early in the summer. Uh, and we've also received, you know, I, I believe CDC guidance from uh, with respect to, to transportation. And it, it went from 24 students on a bus to you can fill a bus to 50 percent capacity. So, <clears throat> you know, the the, the goalposts seem to be moving while we're playing the game here. And it's very frustrating. Yep. Yeah. So, so I do a fact, it, for trying to address, trying to address these five benchmarks, um, you know, really, you know, like you said, while well, the game's going on. So, sorry, all set. I think, I think the ventilation, didn't that come in like late, mid, mid to late August? That's a, that's a new one. It's, that's about it's a week and a half old. Yep. Yeah. That was the chef's August. surprise, frankly, um, that we, we faced all of a sudden. Anyone else? Mrs. Kapiskas, I haven't heard from you. Do you have any thoughts? I, I do have a couple of questions in there. They're probably more specific. I do want to piggyback on Mr. Burke that um, when parents have reached out to me and said, why hasn't this been taken care of? You've had all summer. And I've, I've said to them, have you looked at what's been going on? Um, basically we've been given targets and then they keep moving them closer and moving them further away and you can't hit a moving target very easily. 
and and despite all the efforts that the districts, all of the districts are making to try to meet those targets, it's very hard to meet a moving target, and they're moving and shifting constantly. Uh, but my pointed questions are, are in relation to my special population, special education, multiple language learners, and even students who are struggling uh, with distance learning generally. Um, is there in the plan, even if we, as we may open virtual, is there any plan to make sure we're bringing back the students that are particularly struggling, particularly affected, like MLLs and special ed students, students in IEP, students with 504s, who are really struggling with distance learning and address their needs? If necessary, are we, if we can't open, um, are we offering perhaps temporary placements in out-of-district schools where they can ac accommodate um, real openings, because I know we have out of district schools that are opening to full students, not distance learning. And as an ancillary to that question, I'm also hearing from some of the parents that they're being told that their students may be pulled out of those out of district placements and put back in WED if their students, if their schools are not opening fully, but are going to do distance learning, they're being told the philosophy is, well, you might as well just come back to WED because the behavioral problems aren't going to be addressed in an out of district placement. And we could teach you the same thing at distance. Um, so it's kind of a twofold question, but it all relates to special ed. Hmm. So I'll take the second part first, Ms. Kapiskis. I okay. think, you know, with respect to students that are, that are currently in out of district um, settings being brought back, those will be made based on individual um, what's best for the individual students. Um, I, I don't. I don't think we're we're going to cast a, a wide net and say since we're going back virtually um, and everyone, you know, most everyone's potentially going back virtually that we'll we'll say we'll save some money and and, and bring you back. Um, it, it, we're we're going to definitely take into into account what's best for the student, um, and it may well be better for the student to to remain virtually where they are um or it might be or 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 if or if it's um it, it's it's not a, it doesn't have a negative impact and, and they would want to return to us virtually we would provide that option as well to them Uh, doc, doc, if Dr. Sullivan or, or Mrs. Morell wanted wanted to add anything to to what yeah. I thank you. Yes, um, if I could just address this, um, because we we knew this was coming, I did put money in the IDEA grant. We've already started reaching out. We are calling every single um, student and their family and asking how they want to proceed. Um, in some cases, I've had a couple of parents that have said that they want their child to come back to Woonsocket if it's virtual. I've had others that said, and there are some cases um, because the school is so specialized that even if it is virtual, the parents want their kids there. So we are doing it um, by meeting individually with the parents. And then if the parent wants to change, we're doing an IEP meeting. But we're calling each and every one of them. Great. How about with regard to if we open partially, are they among the students who are gonna be targeting to bring back in the initial wave? I'm talking about special ed, not the out of district, the special I, ed in general. Then I missed the beginning of that. Could you say that again? With regard to special ed students in general, if we are gonna open mainly virtual, um, are, is, do parents with students with IEPs and MML student, MLL students have any hope to believe that they would be the in the first wave that's coming back since they're among those that are losing the most with distance learning. We also, I have put 20 positions in the grant. We are calling each and every special ed family in the district and talking to them about what they would like to see happen. We've had several cases already where we've put an individual and tutor in place because the students have just been um, thrown off so far by the distance learning. Um, in order to help them recover from that, we still have them engaged in tutoring right now, but we're doing that on an individual basis always, with, and that is with each and every student. Sounds like a good plan, thank you. We also, Lynn, just so you know, we have also tried to set this up so it's not just a, a phone call from somebody they don't know, we are trying to match up the phone calls with somebody that knows the family. That's a good plan as well, thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? Can 
I just add one thing to, to the special ed part of it? Um, Lynn, I know that in some cases there were some um, students that needed special um, equipment at home. Um, if we are fully distance learning, then that would also be some of the things that we would um, make sure that the students have the right um, writing utensils or equipment at home. So we will make sure that those are questions that are asked as well when we, when we call the parents. I know those are some issues that did come up, but distance learning started so quickly in March, there just wasn't time. I appreciate the effort. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the superintendent's report. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourdais? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapitvis? Yes. Next, we'll uh, go into the subcommittee reports this morning. Uh, we had a finance subcommittee uh, meeting, uh, which was a, uh, a Google meeting. Um, and we covered various updates. Um, and I'll have Mr. Perry give us more detail, but we, caught, we, we looked at the COVID-related grants, the summer block grant, the stabilization fund grant, the COVID-19 re relief funds. We looked at state aid changes, the projected uh, fiscal 20 closeout and the 20-21 high level fiscal changes. So there was a lot covered and we're still waiting uh, to get final numbers because we still don't know about state funding. Um, and a lot of these things are up in the air or we're applying, um, but hopefully soon we'll know. But Mr. Perrier, if you want to, uh, please give us more detail on, on the things we covered this morning. Uh, yeah, no, no problem at all, Mr. Chairman. Um, we had a we had a few topics. Uh, we did a, I did update the committee on our current status of all of our COVID nineteen related grants. We currently have three of them right now in progress. Uh, one is regarding uh, summer block. Uh, we had some money over the summer for some programs and some additional equipment to run those summer programs. Uh, we also received some stabilization funds that are being applied to fiscal year twenty. Uh, the state aid in fiscal year 20 was cut by $3.3 million, and in lieu of that, uh, we received stabilization funds to uh, match that. But the one problem is that because those uh, dollars were federal, uh, we actually had to share uh, $383,000 with the private schools. So we really weren't even made whole uh, on our full fiscal year 20 uh, state aid number. Uh, we were short $383,000, but we did receive some of that money, a little less than three million, to to help uh, ease that um, that shortfall on state revenue. And finally, our last uh, COVID-related grant is the COVID-19 relief funds. Uh, it's a little short of four million dollars that we are currently applying for. But before we really can get too far into that, we really need to get a final state aid number. Uh, that's going to indicate to us uh, what we uh, if we can use uh, what we can use the money on. If there's necessities that uh, shortage on state aid uh, is going to cause that we're going to need to point more money towards that. So uh, right now we're still, we've applied for the summer block grant, still waiting to hear from Brian on that one, and we're close to the stabilization fund. But as we continue to go and apply for these uh, grants, uh, I will continue to update the school committee as to where we are with them. Uh, we talked about that state aid change a little bit. Uh, we basically lost $383,000 uh, from state aid in June. That was the net total uh, change. And then I gave a quick uh, projected close out for fiscal year 20, uh, a May update. And I will actually get into greater detail on that during my fiscal update. So yeah, that was uh, that was the gist of the subcommittee meeting. Any any comments, questions for, for me or Mr. Perrier? Hearing none, I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the finance committee sub uh, update. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Capwell, Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus? Yes. This morning, we also held a facility subcommittee uh, meeting um, and uh, we discussed various areas and I'll ask Mr. Tariani to give us more detail. We talked about the HVAC uh, cleaning and filters. We talked about uh, different uh, issues with plumbing uh, at Savoy and uh, the, the repair of the Pothier pre-K floor uh, due to water damage, et cetera. 
but I'll ask you, uh, our director of operations, if you would just give us more details, especially on the HVAC cleaning. I know Dr. McGee talked about that, but maybe you can fill in a little bit more. So um, the vendor is in the process of giving us an exact date when they will come out and clean out the remainder of the ductwork in the district. So just briefly, the about two years ago, we started the process of implementing a preventative maintenance program in the district, whereby we would be proactive and clean up the ductwork on a regular basis. Um, that being said, we, we then ran into the situation at the Career Tech Center, which accelerated the process, and we cleaned the entire building there and a portion of the high school. We were going to continue this year with different sections of the high school and, and branch into the elementary schools, but with COVID striking, we need to clean all the ductwork at once. So the vendors out uh, and about in the district checking different things, they're gonna give us an exact start date, I hope in the next few days. They're estimating it will take about 35 days with a full, uh, one of their largest full crews to go in and clean all the ductwork. Uh, one of their smaller crews, it would take them about 110 days to clean out all the ductwork. They did emphasize that the units and the HVAC system will work it's just in order to truly optimize the system, which is what we're looking for, uh, we need to make sure that we get everything cleaned out uh, properly. In addition to that, we have ordered what are called the Mara filters, which I believe we talked about prior meetings. Um, those filters are on order. We're expecting them possibly sometime next week or the week after, at which time the vendor will come out and replace all the filters in the systems um, to bring us up to, I don't say up to code, but up to speed in terms of what the guidelines are requiring us to, to implement at the HVAC systems. This, uh, I've got a question for you, Mr. Notarian and Dr. McGee. Well, we're going through the, um, the walkthrough of the schools next week and the week after maybe with regards to the engineer and the Department of Health. Knowing that our filters won't be up by the 14th, um, and the duct work certainly won't be cleaned by then. I would imagine that a report will be written either by us or by them so that they understand if we cannot open by the 14th or that we will stay virtual. Does that make sense? I mean, they're going to have to go back. I would hope that the DOH is going to go back and tell the governor, by the way, they're not ready or is uh, here are the number of classrooms they have and that's all they can do right now because they can't have the duct work cleaned and they don't have their filters installed. Are you expecting that kind of report uh, that will be issued by them for at least to identify what they found so that we can see what they're telling the governor? I, I would hope so. But, but again, um, two and a half weeks ago, air quality was not a discussion. Right. So, but, but I would, I would hope so based on the fact that, that things are rapidly changing and that this has now come to the forefront that I, I would imagine based on the response we're seeing so far um, that, that they would have something that they would provide to us. I think at the very least, they're going to be out in the buildings doing these checks and they're going to, from what I read in the newspaper, they're going to be checking periodically. So I would imagine they'll be tracking these items and, and noting them mm -hmm. by district. Because I would think by when we make the final decision, this is going to have, this is going to be a big piece of it. It is. I, I don't know what that process is going to look like. I, I just know that they're, they'll they'll be here. Um, I, I can tell you that um, you know the, the governor said that they would be going through every every room in each district. So uh, we have a lot of time to do that. So I, I, I welcome them to come in and and I as Mr. Natariani said, I would expect that they would have some type of. Uh, of, of a report or some type of written feedback that they would be presenting to us, you know, once they complete those inspections. Okay, great. Any other thoughts, uh, comments uh, regarding uh, facilities? Then I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the facility subcommittee update. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Capwell, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Uh, next, we'll go into the technology subcommittee update. I'll turn it over to you, Mrs. Capwell, and Vice Chair Burke. Thank you so much, Chairman Bourget. Um, Mr. Burke, are you okay if I go ahead with the update? Please go ahead. All right. Um, 
So the technology subcommittee um, met on Thursday, August 20th. I'm going to try not to take too much time. However, we did go through a number of topics and the team has done um, such great work that I really do want to give some credit to each of these topics. So if you'll just bear with me. Um, and just, you know, one thing before diving into these topics, I do just want to give a thank you out to the, the technology subcommittee team members specifically. Um, not only do we show up um, almost 100% of the time um, in 100% attendance, but everybody truly does get on that call um, with energy and um, willing to contribute. Uh, and, and for that, I'm super appreciative. So I just want to say that, that quick thanks before we get into this. Um, so we started off by discussing updates to um, technology devices. So the Chromebook distribution and repair process is underway for the 2020-2021 year. Um, the team is in process of prepping Chromebooks for distribution for pre-K and K and any new registrations coming up from the upcoming school year. Um, as the committee uh, likely remembers, there was a deliberate um, decision that was made to leave the Chromebooks with many of the students, which is why we're not going through um, a larger scale redistribution at this time. Um, what I thought was really special is the, a lot of the work that's doing and going out and prepping um, some of these welcome back packages like learning kits, whiteboard and other materials. Um, I know, Al, you said Jeff is doing a lot of work in getting earbuds and headphones and other types of materials and welcome back letters that are kind of a special touch for these kids that are gonna be getting these packages. So wanted to make note of that to the committee. Um, there is a block grant that is being discussed right now um, that would fund essentially some um, technology at the secondary level, specifically with respect to science and the math areas. Uh, there is indicators out there that there would be a benefit from purchasing um, iPad um, technology as well as document cameras. And so as long as we can move this uh, grant process um, through uh, successfully, there will be some additional technology purchases using those monies. Uh, we touched upon distance learning systems. So we've talked about before that there was um, this intent where we joined a data privacy consortium to ensure that as we're moving into this new uh, distance and virtual learning environment that we're maintaining um, compliance um, with respect to student privacy. Um, there has at this time been an official response back to the ACLU when they made a request for data privacy um, information. The team was able to fulfill their requests and it's actually been deemed as successful and that we are in compliance. So another big win for that group. We next talked about home internet. Um, there are a number of programs out there that our internet, that internet providers in general do provide at a discounted rate for those families that qualify either through Cox or Verizon. But right now, um, Al, Dr. Holt and Dr. McGee um, as well as Jeff, have had multiple conversations about facilitating this thought of getting free Wi-Fi out to our families. Um, the effort right now is saying, how do we get grants for about one to two million dollars utilizing um, what we have now, which is our fiber optic network, in order to allow, as I'm restating myself, um, the ability to provide free Wi-Fi to our to our families for use specifically with the technology that we provide to them. There's fingers crossed that it'll go through, but hopefully we'll be updating the committee on that with positive news in the near future. Um, also, <laughs> progress being made as with respect to social media. A few school committee meetings ago, we did talk about the exercise that was underway to have a consolidated, um, um, sponsored and controlled Facebook page, which has been launched. Um, it's been identified that both Facebook and Dr. McGee's Twitter account seem to be a way in which uh, our families enjoy. Um, our so, um, that was also exciting news that we are um, ready to launch the Facebook page. Don't go out there, families looking for it right now. I believe that that's something Dr. McGee will be sharing via a, a link in the near future. So expect that to come. The team will also be redesigning our website and our homepage landing. So um, that is also um, exercise that's underway just in order to um, revamp it. It's a new splash, day, uh, a, a new splash page 
Um, and the redesign is just intended to bring directly to people the information that they're most interested in. So that will be new to come as well. The team has also recognized a need to um, have specific emails developed on our domain to allow for our WED partners to interact in a more effective and efficient way with us and our systems, um, as well as our retirees. And so in understanding that it was not beneficial to either our partners and or our, our retirees to be completely cut off from the email network in two-way communication, instead the team has um, thought outside the box where they were able to create um, email addresses that are still within the Winsocket Schools domain, but are very prescriptive and specific to their individual type of, um, I would say, account. If it's a retiree, it's going to say at retiree.winsocketschools. If it is CCF, it'll say at CCF.winsocketschools. Um, so just another way in which this team is thinking about how to better enhance the overall, um, I would say, environment in communications process with those that, that need it. In keeping with communications, there is also a lot of conversation happening of, around how do how how does the the district ensure that um, teach parents are having the most seamless type of two way communication. Um, investigation has gone into what are the platforms specifically, what are the free platforms and products that we can utilize that parents and teachers are most receptive to. There's a number of tools out there that are uh, able to allow for two way communication, and the group is being pretty specific um, in identifying what those tools are that bet meet, best meet the needs, whether at the primary level and or the secondary level. Um, and I'm thinking I'm getting close to the finish. So telephone systems. We had previously identified that, the, um, that Al and his team were going to go out and get an RFP with a company that we believed could give us some pretty significant savings in either an equally um, competent uh, delivery or um, or enhanced. And so that uh, pricing has come back. There uh, has been identified to be a, um, a significant or a decent cost savings. There is a conversation that still needs to happen um, about whether or not we would make this move. But one thing was for certain that we landed upon was that we do not feel that making any sort of switch while also trying to get ourselves back to school um, would behoove uh, us in any way. And so from a risk reward standpoint, if we are to make any decision to make this change, it would be mid-year when, when things calm down a bit. Um, and last but not least, the team has fulfilled their earlier commitment, um, which is the implementation of security cameras. Um, the high school is fulfilled, middle school is fulfilled, and at the elementary school, we do have a few um, uh, schools left to um, completely round out with security cameras, Harris, Pothier, and Savoy. But they did also add um, one location to that list, uh, which is Barry Field. And so we do now have um, and, and will in the very near future have uh, successfully completed um, the, the, the security camera rollout that Al and his team had uh, started midsummer. So that concludes my update with the exception that we did land on a next meeting date of September 1st. One question I may have, I'll just ask you, Mrs. Capwell, is the, the um, getting the Chromebooks and the backpacks ready, is, did you say that's being delivered now that where the, the parents and families can come and pick them up now uh, or when is that happening so i didn't touch upon that so that's an excellent question i'm going to defer to al for just more detail on that i think they're giving them actually quite frankly a couple of different options that best suit families needs but i'll let al talk a bit more about the, the deployment Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that would be contingent upon uh, the return plan that we uh, eventually execute once we, the committee or the administration comes to a final decision with the governor or the governor comes to a decision that will uh, determine exactly how we, we execute the delivery of them. Whether they're coming, the students coming back, we'll hand them out during school. If they're not, then we will create a distribution program. It will be much more efficient than the packets we did in the spring. The distribution program will occur within the first week of school or within the first few days that we know that we're not coming back if that's the choice. So is it at this point you're going to have all the all the backpacks with all that, all the materials ready to go to them by by 
by building, uh, by grade? Is that what you're planning to do? And that's what you're doing now? Yes. So in, in conjunction with the facilities department, we are not only um, allocating personal protective equipment, PPE equipment, but we're also allocating the technology equipment as well. Okay. And Dr. McGee and Dr. Holt visited Central East even today with me and we, we, we looked through and they've got literally pallets allocated to each location that will be delivered in flatbed trucks um, oh, starting okay. sometime next week. So it, it, it'll, it's quite the if anyone wants to take a tour, you're more than welcome. I'll bring you to Central Receiving. It's it's quite the operation that the tech and facilities teams are, are doing right now. Outstanding. Outstanding. Anyone else have any thoughts, uh, comments? Mr. Mr. Chair Burke. Vice Chair Burke. Um, Mrs. Kaplow, are we st weren't we also still engaged in a conversation to come up with a digital policy? And we were going to think about it in the technology and yet also piggyback with the policy committee is that is that something from the last meeting or yeah yeah i, I can't I, we've at least touched upon it if not in the last meeting but the the previous meeting as well that that is still of of the intent and i think dr burke it was you specifically who um had identified that at a previous meeting when we talked about um these new applications that there is going to need to be something brought forth um, to your your policy meeting, that is correct. Anyone else? Then I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the technology subcommittee update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Burke. Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kipikis. Yes. Thank you. Next, I'll turn turn it over to Mr. Perrier for the financial update. Mr. Perrier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In front of the school committee this evening is the May 2020 fiscal update. Um, as of uh, May 31st, 2020, the school department is currently running a $1.39 million surplus, and I will get into some of the details behind it uh, on these financial highlights, both revenue and expenditure. On the revenue side, indirect costs scheduled to be taken for the fiscal year have been reduced across several of our grants. This has been done in order to provide, provide as much flexibility to our grants budget-wise in the next fiscal year as possible, uh, which is 21 I'm talking about. Uh, currently, there will be no loss of funding. The money will just carry forward into this fiscal year when the grants are closed out. Uh, when I wrote this report, it was an estimated $350,000 in total lost uh, revenue from the state, but as I updated earlier, it's $383,000, so I will make that appropriate adjustment in the June closeout. When I put this together, I was still estimating that expense. Um, I did get into uh, the reason why these, uh, in, the revenue wasn't a straight one-for-one -one swap. It's because the money did need to be shared with the private schools. Finally, on the revenue side, Medicaid revenues have been stronger than anticipated, leading to a surplus of almost a quarter million dollars. On the expenditure side, all regular salaries are projected to be $1.14 million under budget at this time. And when netted with the employee turnover allowance of $836,000, the district is $304,000 under budget. Due to school being fully virtual, we did have significant savings to close the year and substitute salaries. Uh, we didn't use substitutes for that last uh, third of the year. Uh, we are currently finishing the year $295,000 below budget for substitutes. Medical expenses was also a, uh, came in well under budget this year. Uh, we're projected at $1.6 million right now. Uh, the reason being, uh, a lot of people just haven't been going to the doctor. They've been staying away. They've only been going uh, maybe for COVID testing. They've wanted to keep clear. So elective surgeries have certainly been put off. I would anticipate an uptick of some point uh, when the COVID-19 restrictions begin to loosen as we we'll see those people going back in for uh, things that have been put off because of the COVID. Uh, instructional teacher and personal care attendant purchase services were over encumbered for the year. Uh, we've, as we've begun to close out, we released seventy thousand dollars in encumbered expenses. There, transportation is currently projected at one point four million, one point oh four million dollars under budget. This is, of course, because uh, so going when we went fully virtual in March, uh, we stopped running the buses. Added district tuitions are currently projected to be over budget by $158,000, which is, is pretty much where we expected at the beginning of the year. 
At this time, there appears to be no other significant adjustments to any of these line items in these in these areas. And finally, the finance department will continue to make adjustments and closures to outstanding purchase orders. Uh, I would expect a few more funds to be uh, freed up as we finish the final closeout. Uh, due to COVID-19, there has been some delay in mail and there has been some dis delay in correspondence with other companies uh, just to get final invoices and, and receive final things to close out uh, fiscal year 20. I'm hopeful by the end of September, I will have fiscal year 20 totally closed out so that uh, we can move on and focus on fiscal year 21 budget wise. Uh, if this committee has any questions, I'd love to answer them now. Any comments, questions for Mr. Perrier? Nope. I guess once we have final numbers from the uh, state, then uh, we can really proceed because at this point, everything's up in the air. That's that's the big shoe that needs to drop. And after we get that uh, info, we'll then be able to fill back in with the $4 million COVID-19 money. Uh, we'll be able to complete that grant and right. then really get a handle on where we're at uh, once we know if we're how, kind of how we're starting school. Okay, very good. I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the financial update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kapiska. Yes. Next, I'll, we'll turn to the facilities technology update. Mr. Notariani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, under technology, just a brief note in the memo, we have Chromebooks ready for pre-K K and newly registered students for the upcoming school year. As I just stated a little while ago, we will have everything ready for distribution depending upon how we reopen. In addition to the hardware uh, that we're deploying in the, net, uh, the district, we've also are in the process of configuring our data system for the upcoming school year. And without boring everyone, you can see there's a substantial list of data systems and applications that we support and push out to students and staff alike. Uh, in addition to that, we are uh, going to start later this week reporting to uh, our data to RIDE uh, and for our state reporting purposes. And uh, as you can see there, our enrollment, academic calendar, homeschooling, career and tech center data, and related teacher course student data will be uploaded to the state. Uh, in terms of facilities, uh, you can see there is a, in the memo, a general projects list that were projects that were completed throughout the summer, uh, broken down by general projects, electrical and painting. Uh, the facility staff and custodial staff have been quite busy getting the buildings disinfected and ready for the start of the school year. Uh, and just, I would like to state that I am uh, deeply grateful for the um, facility staff, custodial staff and the technology staff. They've done an absolutely outstanding job Teamwork, team, as, as Mrs. Capwell uh, emphasized uh, for the tech subcommittee, but teamwork is definitely the, the term, not only at that level, but also at the administrative level. The, the team at McPhee is just absolutely supportive. And I'm very grateful to, to work with a great uh, cadre of professionals. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Notariani, I mean, I know we had approved uh, 15 additional custodians. Where do we stand? Uh, with applicants and people that we've hired? I believe we um, are at the point where we have either four or five individuals that will be ready to start. Um, those individuals um, will be brought forward, I believe, um, in the very near future. Um, we're in the process uh, right now with working with uh, 1137, the bargaining unit for the custodial staff to uh, come up with a memorandum of agreement which I think will be coming forward. I think Mr. Hargan or Dr. McGee could, or Mr. Perrier could comment further on that, but I believe that's forthcoming in the very near future. Okay, okay. Um, are they, where are they going to be deployed? Where will you deploy the new uh, buyers? So we're going to distribute them based on building size. At this point, I believe the high school and career tech each will receive two additional part-time custodians. And then each elementary school, uh, each middle school will receive um, two, and then each elementary school will have one for a total of 15. If I've had that you know, based, on, based on the walkthroughs that we're going to perform in the next couple of weeks to determine which school buildings can be used, wouldn't you be thinking of concentrating the staff to really make sure those buildings and those rooms are ready and up to snuff? 
Uh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'd like to point out Ms. Dargan had an excellent idea from the beginning. I think Mr. Perry also contributed to making sure that we wrote this in such a way that they're not assigned to the individual buildings, but rather they're assigned district wide. So that provides us the flexibility to um, reassign them where the need may be. So again, that's a credit to Ms. Dargan and, and Mr. Perry. Great. Any other comments uh, from Mr. Notoriani? Hearing none, Dr. Uh, I'll make a motion to receive on play to, uh, on file the uh, facilities technology update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiska? Yes. Next, uh, we have unfinished business. Um, I'll make a motion to discuss and approve. The fiscal restraint and crisis intervention policy for second passage. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Any additional discussion on this uh, policy? <clears throat> Hearing none, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Uh, next, we'll go into. Uh, New business. I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the district strategic plan. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> second, Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, each of you have um, the link in your uh, on your agenda to the 2020-2023 Woonsocket Education Department's district strategic plan. Um, I'm going to just sort of um, lay a little bit of the foundation here before I go through the uh, key parts of the plan. I'm not going to go through the, the plan in its entirety because that, that would take quite a long time. Um, but there are certain parts that I, I want to uh, go over and address with the committee. So first, I, I just want to thank and I want to recognize the efforts uh, of all of those folks within the district and within the Woonsocket community who um, who put forth um, a, a lot of teamwork to, to make this plan um, one which I believe is, is very concise and very strong. Um, this was, was a challenging time. It's always a challenging um, time when you put together a, a strategic plan. It, it's not an easy process. It takes many, many months and um, it's hard enough to do when you meet in person. And we started this process in person in January, um, but soon, that process of in-person turned to a virtual process. So I, I want to thank all the parents, um, students, uh, community members, community organizations, teachers and staff, uh, our leadership team in the district, as well as uh, members of the school committee for making this uh, possible. So we decided in the very beginning, before we started to work on the plan, to uh, to choose a three-year plan versus our old plan, which was a five-year plan. Um, we, we also chose to focus on fewer strategic objectives. Uh, if you recall, the old plan had about 14 priority, areas of priority, and we felt as though, although they were, they were all important, um, it was, it was, um, it wasn't as focused as it could have been. So we made that decision early on to really focus um, on, on just a handful of uh, key strategic ob objectives. Um, the data really drove this process. We utilized a variety of data, uh, both internal data that we collect here in the WED um, and external data, which we, uh, we get from you know, things such as our uh, RICAS scores um, and, and our NAEP scores and, and other types of, of data that come from outside of our of our district. Um, the theme that we used when we put this plan together was really a, a construction theme and you're going to see as, as we go through the, the document, uh, you're going to see really a, a, a construction of, of really a, a house which starts with a foundation and, and, and leads to the, to the roof. Um, and lastly, I want to thank the uh, consulting firm that we worked with, uh, Teaching and Learning Alliance, again with Dr. Scott Borstel and Mr. Ed Lee, their facilitation of, of this plan was was very, very um, 
very powerful, and I really appreciate working with them. And as I said earlier, we, we're looking forward to working with them um, with respect to our, our administrative, uh, our administ administrators' instructional leadership uh, over the next few years. So why engage in a strategic planning process? Um, a strategic plan is a very powerful tool that assists the district in really staying focused on, on what it is, what it wants to be, and how it can achieve those important goals. It's a set of actions um, that an organization chooses in order to meet those objectives. And, and it, 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 as part of this process, um, it also gives us an opportunity to seek feedback from our constituents. Um, it's not just you know, utilizing the folks from within the district, but it's utilizing our community members. It's utilizing our, our families. It's utilizing um, other people in our community who help us to uh, create the plan and achieve our goals. And lastly, it's a blueprint for improvement. It, a strategic plan is all about improvement. Um, and, and, it's, and it's about improvement for the next three years here in the Woonsocket Education Department. The process that we followed was a three-step process. As I said earlier, it began in, in January of, of 2020. Um, so the document that you have here, uh, if you go to the uh, second page of the document, you'll see, as I said a, a moment ago, there's a, there's a structure here. And the structure is made up of, of, a, of a variety of, of components. The first is really the, um, the, the, the building block at the bottom are, are our core values. Um, and and that's, that's what we believe um, in our district. You know, every, every organization has core values or, or beliefs that they have that drive everything that they do uh, throughout the organization. And our core values are student achievement, personal growth, partnerships and collaborations, school climate, and resources. Next, we have our new mission statement. The mission statement is really the, the organization, or in our case, the school departments, reason for existing. It's what we do. And our mission is that the Woonsocket Learning Community provides all learners a safe and rigorous learning experience that embraces diversity, culture, and individuality to create productive members of our global community. Our previous plan, plan's mission statement, said the Woonsocket Education Department. And one, one of the things that we changed here in, in, with our mission statement is that it goes beyond the Woonsocket Education Department. Our educating the, the children in Woonsocket, while it's the, it's the primary responsibility of the Woonsocket Education Department, it's not solely the Woonsocket Education Department's responsibility, and it's the learning community um, across uh, this, this city. If you go above our mission statement, that's where you're going to find four pillars. And the four pillars are the, the strategic objectives. And as, as you're aware, the previous plan had about 13 or 14 of those. So we've really, uh, you know, taken what we had um, and we've really focused on, on the four most important. And those are teaching and learning, learning environments, family and community support, engagement and partnerships, and human capital. And I'm going to get into those in a, in a few minutes. I'm going to be talking about each of those four, and I'm going to talk about um, – the, uh, the, the components of those and the objectives of those. And lastly, at the top, we have a vision. And our, and our vision is, is it's what we aspire to be. Where do we want to be? And it, it really is, it's, it's kind of simple, but it, it's, it's simple, but I think it's, it, it'll, it'll be one that's really easy for people to, A, remember, because if you have a vision statement that is three paragraphs, um, people, they, they, they tend to, to forget about it. Um, and this one is, is really straightforward. And it's simply to establish a premier school district by continuously improving teaching, leading, and student learning. Everything we do here is, is with the goal of improving student learning. And we do that through improving teaching and leading. If you turn to page If you turn to page 10 in your document it's just below vision our vision statement um, it's it's the it's below um, what our what our new vision 
uh, statement is it's a, it's it's called theory of action, and and a theory of action is is an if then statement, and basically, if we do certain things, then certain things will result from that. So I'm going to read this to you. It's 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 a little lengthy, but it but it incorporates really <laughs> all pieces of our mission, vision, core values, and and the four pillars of our plan. So we believe that if we provide high quality curriculum and instruction, supportive environments that foster social, emotional, and academic growth, utilize family and community resources, and recruit, support, and retain a superior workforce, then we'll provide all learners a safe and rigorous learning experience that embraces diversity, culture, and individuality to create productive members of our global community. If you go to the next page, this is where um, we start with the four pillars. And you know, as I said a moment ago, the, the foundation of our, of our plan are our core values. The, the four pillars are, are, is, is actually the work that we're going to do to achieve, uh, to ultimately reach our vision and, and, to, um, and to achieve the goals that we want to uh, achieve over the next three years. And the first pillar, as I said earlier, is teaching and learning. That pillar, there are, there are strategic initiatives. There are six of them that fall under teaching and learning. Um, and, the, and the objective of teaching and learning is to improve student learning through consistent and high quality curriculum and enhanced instruction. Pillar two is our learning environments. And what does that mean? It means this, improving student learning through supportive environments in our schools, which foster social, emotional, and academic growth. Pillar number three includes our families and our community, and it's family and community support, engagement, and partnerships. And that strategic objective is improving student learning through supportive family and community resources. And our fourth and final pillar is human capital. And the objective here is to improve student learning through recruitment, support, and retention of a superior and diverse workforce. If you noticed, each of those strategic objectives start with the, with the phrase, improving student learning. As I said earlier, everything we do in this district, the end game is to improve student learning, whether it's hiring the, the brightest and the best teaching staff, um, or it's providing a learning environment through our physical plant. It's providing student learning. It's improving, it's making those opportunities better for our students so that they can improve their student learning. So the meat and potatoes of, of, of this plan, if you go to the next page, um, and I'm not gonna go through each one of these individually because there, there are quite a few, but I'll just explain to you um, how this is is laid out. So the next, the, this next page, page twelve, lists pillar number one, teaching and learning. Below that, it describes the strategic objective, which I just uh, listed for you for each of the pillars. But below that, it has specific initiatives. So these are these are the things we're going to do to to reach those that strategic objective so i'll i'll give you an example and i'll, I'll i will go through pillar number one um, just to give you a sense of, of how to read this so the strategic initiative number one is to develop a strong curriculum content that ensures horizontal and vertical fidelity in delivery so what that means is we want to develop a curriculum in grades pre k, k through 12 that ensures a horizontal. So when I say a horizontal, I mean you're going from, um, so if you're in, let's say, the, the first grade, all first grades in the district have the same consistent curriculum. Um, and the fidelity of delivery is how teachers deliver that instruction. So it's be, it, it would be providing a variety of professional development, providing curricula to our staff that's consistent um, across grade levels. Vertical fidelity means you're going from one grade to the next so that that, so that curriculum, that scope and sequence follows um, in, a, in, a, in a pattern 
that is developmentally appropriate for our students. If you go to the next column, uh, the outcome. So the outcome of that initiative is consistent delivery of curriculum to ensure all students receive the skills necessary to be successful in their learning. So that's the outcome uh, from that strategic initiative number one. The timeline, and we have the timeline broken up. Um, next year, we, we're looking to review the K through 12 science and social studies uh, curricula, as well as the six through 12 math and the grades nine through 12 ELA uh, curricula. In 21-22, we are looking to pilot a high quality uh, curriculum in science, social studies, math, and ELA. So we're gonna begin the work this coming year uh, with respect to those subject areas with the goal of 21-22 um, piloting a, a curriculum in each of those areas. Um, and then full implementation would be in 2022-23. The last column will be the person or persons responsible for that action. And that would be Dr. Holt, the Director of Curriculum and Development, um, uh, Mrs. DeRiso, Director of Literacy Title I, our secondary department chairs at our high school, um, and our building administrators, principals, and assistant principals. So that's an example of how you read this document. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through every single strategic initiative because we'd be here for a long, long time. Um, but um, I, I guess the, the takeaway from this is that um, this really is a concise document. It's one that I think is will be easy for our, our staff to, to read and to refer to. Um, and, it, and it's not a document that's, you know, 40 or 50 pages long. Um, so I, I feel really good about this. I, I feel as though uh, the the work that was put into this was well thought out. Um, it's aligned with with many of the initiatives that we're already implementing in the district, and it's also looking forward to some work that we're going to need to do to prepare uh, over the next three years. So, having said that, uh, I am. Um, I'm open to any any questions that you may have. The only comment I have, Dr. McGee, is that it appears to me that the district plan that doesn't comprehend COVID, or said another way, COVID does not impact uh, the plan. The right. plan, the your structure that you've built, this plan right. that you that you that we want to approve, yes, takes into account the. the curriculum and the education plan that you want to present regardless if we're in school or in distance learning. Am I correct? You're correct, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you're, you're correct. I mean, the, the pieces that would, would be affected by uh, distance learning, you know, you're look, we're looking at the technology pieces um, that, that's built in, in here. Um, that would be one example that I, that I would use. Uh, the, the part of the plan that, um, that talks about the um, learning environments, something that we, we talked about tonight uh, going through um, and, and ensuring that we have, you know, proper air quality um, in our classrooms and in our buildings. So, so, so each of those components that we're dealing with through distance learning, they, they do fall in each one of, in, in one of those or, or multiple uh, pillars. And I also, it seems to me also, and maybe Mrs. Kapiskas can add to this, but it seems like the plan also comprehends our special uh, special education students. Yes, it does. Yep, all all of our students. This, you know, if if you if you look at our if you go back to our uh, our mission statement, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we included was um, you know a, a, a safe and rigorous learning experience that embraces diversity culture and individuality. So when you look at diversity, we're looking at diverse learners that have multiple needs. You know, whether okay. our, our students with, with IEPs or our, our English language learners, um, we, we wanted to make sure that that was included in our mission statement. Okay. Anyone else have any comments for Dr. McGee? Chairman Mr. Borges. Mr. Yeah, Scott? thank you um, so much. I'm just gonna start off by saying this 
this work looks like it, it definitely was a, a, a lot that went into it and so happy to see the broad range of participants that you had in building this plan because that's a lot of times half the battle right is making sure you've got the right people involved um i know you had said early on that you would recognize the previous year's plans had us spread so thin that virtually you know rendered them un unable to be um met as far as those goals so also love the fact that you guys reeled it in and even took it a step further to really hone in that every uh, action is intended to improve student learning. So a really, again, job well done. Um, I think my my only comments in really looking at it and one of my favorite sayings at work is that which is measured gets done. And in going through some of the plans and in the, the, the actions and outcomes, there are some some that span the full 2020 to 2023 timeframe um, and, and also recognize that there are definitely some individuals within the responsibility realm that have a number of, of responsibilities under their belt. And so my question is twofold. Um, will each of those um, um, will each of those pillars and those those outcomes have further detailed um, tasks and timelines associated with the how are we going to achieve this and time frames around it that way we're measuring it as the years go on and then what is a benefit of course of doing that should you be doing that is that you start to recognize how much level of support each of those in responsible parties needs to actually then affect that outcome um so that was my question essentially is is the intent to have um is to to double click or drill down a bit more into each of those in in an intention to eventually be successful it is and you're right some of the the timelines are, are just a span um of the three years um so those that are spanning the three years um we will drill down um mm -hmm. those um to, to make sure that we are we're, we're making clear what what needs to be accomplished and by when within those three years so we will do that. Okay. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Dr. McGee, roll call. Raymond Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Next, I'll make a motion to discuss, approve, to appoint an assistant principal to the Pothia Citizens Campus. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Vice Chair Burke and Mrs. Capwell, Dr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to recommend Ms. Kathy Carvalho for the position of assistant principal at the Pothier Citizens Elementary School campus. Ms. Carvalho joins the Woonsocket Education Department with over nine years public school administration, administration experience and over 11 years experience as a teacher in Rhode Island. Most recently, Mrs. Carvalho was the director of early childhood for the Fall River Public School District in Massachusetts. There, she oversaw multiple grants, managed registration and screening, planned and facilitated professional development, and supervised the early childhood special education staff, as well as pre-K and K teachers for the entire school district. Prior to her role there, she was principal for an elementary school of an elementary school in Fall River, Mass, as well as vice principal um, in, in a uh, elementary school in Central Falls, Rhode Island. Ms. Carvalho holds a Bachelor of Science in Education and a Master's of Education in ESL from Rhode Island College. She's highly qualified per the Rhode Island Department of Education regulations as a building level administrator. Based on Ms. Carvalho's education and work experience, I highly recommend her for the position of Assistant Principal for the Pothier Citizens Elementary School campus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any thoughts, comments? I think it's fantastic that, Kathy, you want to be part of this uh, great system. Uh, Dr. McGee, why don't you give us the roll call? Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Congratulations, Kathy. Welcome. Good job. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Next, um, I'll make a motion to discuss yeah. the appointment of an assistant principal to the Woonsocket Area Career and Technical Center. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I am pleased to recommend Mr. Kevin Lamoureux for the position of assistant principal at the Woonsocket Area Career and Technical Center. Mr. Lamoureux is currently our project aware grant coordinator and prior to that served as a social worker and attendance officer for the school department. Mr. Lamoureux has over seven years experience working with pre-K through grade 12 students and over five years experience working in the service industry, giving him the skills needed for the career and technical center. Mr. Lamoureux holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in, Soci in psychology from the University of Rhode Island, as well as a master's degree in social work from Rhode Island College. In addition to that, he completed his principal residency network here in the Woonsocket Education Department. He is a youth mental health first aid trainer, and he is certified in crisis prevention and intervention, youth restorative practices, therapeutic crisis intervention, as well as many more. He is highly qualified per the Rhode Island Department of Education regulations as a building level administrator. Based on Mr. Lamoureux's education and work experience, I highly recommend him for the position of assistant principal for the Woonsocket Area Career and Technical Center. Any comments or questions for Dr. McGee? Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas. Yes. And I believe uh, Mr. Lamro is is in attendance in a meeting. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done. Welcome. Good job. Next, I'll make a motion. Um, we don't need a motion since uh, we're going to have a discussion on the submission of the 2019-2020 annual report for the Woonsocket Special Education Local Advisory Committee, CELAC. I'll turn it over to Mrs. Kapiskas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, each year, the CELAC presents, um, as required by its bylaws, an annual report for the school committee of its activity through the years. Um, through the year, uh, the CELAC is a group of special education parents who come together to act in an advisory commit capacity to the special education department and the district as a whole on issues reg regarding special education. And we're very, very lucky in that our district has attendance by our special ed director and assistant special ed director and our superintendent at almost every single meeting we have, as well as other directors from the district um, who pop by when uh, items on our agenda uh, touch upon their particular areas. We've been very lucky in that regard. And the CELAC does appreciate the participation of all those directors who attend those meetings. As a general rule, the CELAC meets the first Thursday of each month, September through June. Of course, 2019-2020 uh, was different for all of us. Uh, the CELAC met every month except December. Um, in December, the meeting was changed to a potluck um, holiday gathering. Um, and our last meeting occurred, of course, in March. There were no meetings in April, May, or June due to COVID. Not sure when meetings are going to resume. We're working on that right now. I'd like to try to do something virtually in September, but it just doesn't make sense to do it until we have a better handle on where the special ed students will be because that's the primary question they're all going to want answered. And it doesn't make sense to meet until we can do that. The report that I've presented to you on behalf of the CELAC includes the minutes from each and every one of our CELAC meetings. You can know what goes on at all those meetings, even though I give you my brief summary at each uh, school committee meeting as I act as the liaison uh, for the CELAC. It also includes the agenda for each of those meetings. Unfortunately, I'm unable to include the attendance because uh, those sheets aren't in my possession. Uh, when I was elected to the school committee in 2018, I had to give up my uh, chairmanship of the CELAC and at that time, another mom, Marjana Piertowski, uh, stepped up to act as chair. Um, with the result of distance learning coming into play, it just became overwhelming for her in, in looking ahead to distance learning. And potentially in the coming year, um, she's informed me and as well as the special ed director that she just can't do it anymore. So as a result, uh, she submitted her letter of resignation. And we thank her very much for her service over the last two years. Uh, obviously, we can't have an election because we can't have a meeting. So at this point, I've spoken to Dr. Sullivan and Don Morello, and we're just going to continue to go forward, the three of us, developing an agenda and presenting meetings virtually or in person, as the case may be, until such time as we're able to locate another candidate to take over as chair. Uh, but as of right now, we have not stated a date to resume our meetings, 
If there is no meeting in September, I'm hopeful there'll be at least a meeting in October, which would more than likely be held virtually unless Mr. Notariani tells me otherwise. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I think it's very important, obviously, to find someone who would like to take over the chair of the committee because CELAC is a very important component of the Woonsocket Education Department because through you uh, and the parents that are involved in CELAC, we get to know more about the needs of our special education students because uh, often, too often over the years, uh, they may have been neglected, uh, they have been forgotten, but you, CELAC has always made sure to bring uh, those children uh, to our attention. So I really thank you and Marjena and all the parents that have been involved and Dr. Sullivan and Ms. Mrs. Morell to, uh, to really get involved with, with the parents and the children that need special attention and our help. So again, many thanks and hopefully we can find a chairman sooner than later. Thanks again. Anyone else? I thank you all for uh, attending tonight's meeting and so we'll adjourn well, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn the school committee meeting at 837. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Yes. We are adjourned. Thank well, you all. Well. For, Thank for you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye now. Congratulations again, Kevin. Thank you.